Thank you, Torrin. I'm going to read today from Matthew's Gospel in chapter 16, and uh, starting with verse uh, 13. So, uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, starting with verse 13, says this, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Verse 14 says, And they, that is the disciples, said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Now this is after, of course, that John the Baptist had been killed by Herod. And so what they mean by that is some say he's John the Baptist come back to life. Uh, some, Elias, uh, that's the Greek version of the, the name Elijah from the Old Testament. Uh, so some are saying you're John the Baptist. Uh, some are saying you're Elijah. Others, Jeremiah. That's the Greek version of Jeremiah, one, another of the Old Testament prophets, or one of the prophets. And after they gave that answer, Jesus said in verse 15, He saith unto them, But whom do you say that I am? You see, first they, he asked them, who do, What's the rumors? You know, what are people saying? And then he says, What do you say? Um, verse 16 it seems that the only one that was brave enough to speak up here was Simon Peter. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, now before we go and read Jesus' uh, answer, um, let's talk about this um, thing that Peter said here, Simon Peter. He said, Thou art the Christ. Uh, Christ is uh, not the name of Jesus. It's not his last name. It's a title. Um, the Greek word is Christos. And it literally means the anointed one or the chosen one. Uh, the Greek, it's a Greek word, the equivalent uh, in the Old Testament or for them, their scriptures, uh, is the Hebrew word that becomes Messiah. Um, the term Christos means, as I said, anointed one, and it goes back to in the uh, Old Testament when, uh, for instance, when God chose David to be king. Um, you know, there was a king named Saul, and uh, he, he disobeyed God and behaved in uh, bad ways, and so uh, God told Samuel, go to the house of Jesse, and uh, anoint for me a king. And God was going to choose one because Saul was being rejected. And so God was going to himself choose a king. Uh, that's where we get this idea that uh, anointed means uh, chosen. And so uh, to make a long story short, uh, finally David was presented. And when David came before Samuel, he took his horn of oil on God's instruction and poured it over the head of David. And that was to signify uh, the Holy Spirit of God was uh, poured out upon or uh, uh, given to uh, David for his role uh, as king. And so he was anointed, we might say, with oil, uh, which symbolized the Holy Spirit. And at that time, uh, the Holy Spirit was only resident in the king, as in this case, and in the prophet uh, Samuel. Um, and so that was the, the limited scope of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so uh, as the uh, Old Testament progressed, David, for one, gave many prophecies uh, after this time in the Psalms. Many of his Psalms are prophetic. And he speaks of one that is to come uh, one that is called the son of David um, that will come and the, the doctrine or the idea of a Messiah, a coming Messiah um, grew up and there are many scriptural references to uh, the coming Messiah, the anointed one. In uh, Greek, the word Christos, the uh, anointed one. See what Peter is saying here is he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He's saying you're the Messiah. You are the chosen one. 
Now there's a whole background of expectation from Old Testament prophecies that Peter is drawing on. And not just Peter. It was the common Jewish expectation in the first century that uh, based on these prophecies, David uh, chief among them, uh, that the Messiah, when he appeared, would uh, defeat Israel's enemies and establish a reign of peace. Uh, the Pharisees expected the Messiah to purify the temple and restore what they saw as proper uh, worship. Now, actually, Jesus did all those things, but not in the way that they expected. Uh, Jesus uh, did defeat Israel's enemies. The only problem was, to them, uh, they thought their enemies were the Romans. Uh, the enemies that Jesus defeated were invisible spiritual enemies. Um, they imagined that Jesus would institute a reign of peace. And he did institute a reign of peace. But it was not an external peace in the physical, political realm, but it was internal. In other words, Jesus fulfilled all of these prophecies. The only difference was they didn't recognize what he was doing and what he was all about because they were looking for something external. And, and really, while we're on this little top, this is a little side thought, that still today is a problem uh, in the church. Uh, many Christians fall into the same trap, looking for external things rather than realizing that Christianity and the reign of Christ and the kingdom of Christ, however you want to characterize it or label it, is spiritual and internal in the lives of individuals. Jesus reigns in the lives of individuals, in, in our hearts. Um, so when Peter is saying, you are the Christ, uh, he's identifying, he's saying, you're the chosen one. You're the one David predicted. You're the one that Jeremiah predicted. You're the one that they said was coming. Um, you are the Christ, that Isaiah, Isaiah has a lot to say about the coming Messiah. Uh, now Peter, uh, it's safe to say, Simon Peter, uh, probably did not really understand either the, the scope and the reality and the, you know, uh, the spiritual nature of what Jesus was about. Nevertheless, he's saying, he is saying, you are, you know, I'm recognizing him. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And here in verse 17, Jesus answered him and said, blessed art thou Simon Barjona. Now see, we call Simon, Simon Peter, but his real name is Simon Barjona. Barjona means, when you say bar in Hebrew, you're saying son of. He's saying Simon, son of Jonah. Um, that was his name. That was his actual name, Simon. Now, here's where he got the name Peter, right, in this little passage. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. What he's saying is, you know, you didn't get this from somebody else, but you got to revelate. You see this because God is showing it to you. Uh, and he's saying that's you're blessed because of that. Verse 18, he says, And I also say to thee, thou art Peter. Now that's why we call him Simon Peter, because Jesus named him that. We might say this is like a, a nickname. Um, his name before this time was not Peter. But yet that's what we all call him now. And Jesus gave him this name. The word Peter actually in the Greek language is Petros, which means a stone or a rock. And uh, that's what Jesus means here. He's calling him a rock or a stone. Uh, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, uh, a, a rock. He gives him that name. And upon this rock, you see that's what the, you know, the connection is. He says, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, uh, how do we interpret this? In the Roman Catholic world, the way they interpret it, as I understand it, I'm not a Roman Catholic, but from my understanding, they say, well, Jesus is establishing Peter as sort of like a little mini ruler of the church. He said, Peter is the first pope. Uh, but Jesus didn't say Pope, uh, but that's what they believe. They believe in the Roman Catholic tradition that Peter was the first Pope and then there was a long succession of, of leaders of the church up until the present day with the Pope. Uh, on the evangelical side of things, on the other extreme, uh, m many commentators, I would say most of them, sort of skirt the issue and say, well, he didn't really mean that Peter. He didn't really mean Peter. He meant 
uh, the fact that when he said, uh, on this rock I will build my church, he meant the thing that Peter said, uh, you are the Christ, and that's the rock on which you built the church. However, I want to say, I would just like to suggest, let me just follow me while I try this out on you. I would just like to suggest that he really did mean Peter. Uh, he meant exactly what he said. Uh, and he meant, uh, upon this rock will I build my church. And he meant Peter. But he wasn't thinking, you know, one thing you'll notice if you read the Gospels, Jesus says things, but he means something spiritual. For instance, one time he told the Pharisees, destroy this temple and in three days I will rear it up again. And they looked around, thought he meant the building, but he meant the temple of his body. Um, he's constantly saying things like that, speaking in a spiritual way, uh, not in the, the natural, like obvious way. But I think he did mean Peter, but he meant Peter as, can I say, a prototype of the Christian, of the average Christian. He said, and, and he says, upon this rock I will build my church. Now notice that this is future tense. See, there's no church yet. Uh, he says, I will build my church. There are no Christians yet. See, these disciples of Jesus, we could not really correctly call them Christians. They were Jewish followers of Jesus, and they considered him like a teacher or a rabbi or a prophet. Technically speaking, there is no church until after the redemptive work of Jesus. You see, we're not Christians because of, of our practices or because of where we go to church or any of those other things. We are Christians because we believe in the redemptive work of Jesus. Uh, when he shed his blood on the cross to eliminate our sins. We put our faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross. As of this moment, he has not yet done that. He's speaking in the future tense, but he is saying, uh, Peter, can I paraphrase it? You are like a, you are the rock, and, and, and I'm going to build my church on people just like you. <laughs> that's, I think that's what he's saying. Because Peter really, uh, if you read about Peter in the Gospels, he is so much like us. <laughs> He's so much like the ordinary Christian. He, and I'm gonna show you this in a moment. He's constantly making mistakes. He's constantly saying the wrong thing. He's constantly making promises he can't keep. <laughs> uh, He's constantly bumbling and putting his foot in his mouth. Do you understand what I mean by that? Uh, and uh, making mistakes and misunderstanding things. And so I think Jesus is deliberately saying, you know what, Peter? But see, here in his favor, Peter is very sincere. Peter is sincere and he has a childlike faith in Jesus. See, he's just a common fisherman. He's not a student of theology. He didn't go to the seminary. He's not a, you know, he wasn't a, a priest studying in the temple. He's just a fisherman and Jesus chose him. And here in this little instance when he says, Jesus, you are the one we've been looking for. Now, it's pretty clear, and I'm going to show you, it is pretty clear that, G that Peter had no understanding, really, of what he was saying. Yet nevertheless, uh, like Jesus said, nobody explained this to you, Peter. You got this directly from God. And even though Peter didn't understand, I think it's pretty safe to say, the full ramifications of what he was saying, nevertheless, he was expressing his faith in Jesus as the chosen one or the anointed one sent from God. He said, you are the son of the living. He's, he's saying you are sent from God. He's recognizing Jesus' status and he's placing his faith in him. Uh, and so Jesus, I believe, this, this is my interpretation of it. This is the rock on which I will build my church, Peter. Uh, he calls him Peter, you know. He gives him that nickname, Rock. And this is, and you, just like you, people just like you, are going to believe in me. And even though they make mistakes and fail, they have a, a simple, sincere faith in me. And that's that's my church. Um, so I just want to show you a couple of, just to you know, uh, not to you know, uh, beat up on Peter, but just to show you how really how average uh, and like us he is. So first of all, right in this very chapter, I'm going to skip down. Now, right after this, just almost immediately after this, skip down to verse 21. I call this in incident, uh, Peter fails to understand and then says something dumb. <laughs> uh, this is in verse 21. Same chapter, skip on down to verse 21. 
almost immediately after he has this conversation with Peter, verse 21 says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Now let me stop for a moment. Do you know, do you understand why he's explaining that to them? Do you, do you get the import? It says from this point forward he began to explain to them. It's because Peter said you're the Christ. You're the one prophesied or predicted in the Old Testament. Yet they, meaning Peter and really uh, Israel as a nation and certainly the chief priest, everyone generally had this expectation that Jesus was going to be some kind of a military leader, that he was going to overthrow the Romans and, and, and reform the government and uh, enforce the observance of the Torah and, you know, and, and do all these reforms and bring in what we would as Christians call the millennium, uh, like a reign of peace and prosperity out here in this natural world. So Jesus, because Peter has identified him as the one predicted by the Old Testament prophets, David and others, Jesus is explaining to them what it really means, what, what really he is going to do. And so he says, and he's pretty explicit about it, from that time forth, he began to show his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. You see, that's how he was going to defeat our enemies, by taking sin to the cross and paying for it and eliminating it as a factor. They didn't understand that. But yet he's trying to tell them. He is telling them. So Peter, this rock, <laughs> the one he just named uh, Peter, uh, the rock, on this rock I will build my church after he pronounces blessing. Look at what Peter says. See, he doesn't understand, and then he has something to say about it. Verse 22 says, Peter took him, that's Jesus, and began to rebuke him. <laughs> that means he was correcting him. I can just imagine him putting his arm around Jesus and leading him away from everybody. Jesus, I, I got to tell you this. <laughs> he began to rebuke him uh, and saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. In other words, he's like saying, Jesus, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, that's not what you're going to do. You're going to be a big military leader. You're going to come and overthrow the government. You're going to, you know, you, this didn't compute with him. So he's taking him aside and saying, you know, he's correcting him. He's saying, no, Jesus, that's not, that's not what you're going to do. That's, that's basically what it says here. Verse 23. Remember, this is Peter, the rock on which Jesus is building a church. He, verse 23 says, he, Jesus, turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> now talk about a, a pretty stern rebuke. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Uh, let me read this to you from another translation so you get the import of it. Um, this is the Christian Standard Bible. Get behind me, Satan, for you're a hindrance to me because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but instead human concerns. I, I think that is so like us. I mean, that's so typical. Now, see, that doesn't mean Peter is, is rejected in any way, but it means he's screwed up here. He made a big mistake. I mean, he's wrong. He misunderstood, and he said something dumb, uh, so much like, uh, like us. Uh, here's the Phillips translation. Then Jesus turned around and said to Peter, Get out of my way, Satan. You stand right in my path, Peter, when you look at things from man's point of view and not God's point of view. Well, that's the point. Peter was looking at things from a human point of view, uh, not from God's point of view. And uh, again, this doesn't mean Peter was rejected. Certainly not. But uh, he was capable of misunderstanding and saying the wrong thing and going, you know, in his mind having some confusion and wrong ideas in his mind. He had uh, the right faith in his heart, but some wrong ideas in his head. Uh, that's very common, and uh, we're, we're vulnerable. Okay, here's another one. This is in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, starting with verse 28. I call this instant, instance, Peter falls asleep and then says something dumb. It always ends up with Peter saying something dumb. And again, I'm not picking on Peter. I think Jesus um, chose him and said, on this rock I will build my church, because he's saying, uh, 
there's going to come a church full of Christians and they're going to be just like you, Peter, and that's just what I want. See, uh, Jesus knows what we're like, yet he wants us anyway. Luke chapter 9, verse 28. I'm still looking for it here. I bet Torrance already got it. Luke chapter 9, verse 28. This incident, incident is called uh, Peter falls asleep and then says something dumb. Okay, uh, verse 28. Gee, and it came to pass... Am I in the right? Okay, I'm in the right place. It came to pass about uh, an eight days after these sayings that he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. We call this instance, we call this the transfiguration. A spiritual appearance took place. Uh, Jesus was transformed before them. Verse 29 says, as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, that's Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. You see, that's what they were talking to him about. That's the whole plan. That's what he told them he was going to do. And so these um, Old Testament prophets appeared in this spiritual vision, Moses and Elijah saying, you know, confirming him and talking to him about what he was about to do. And you could spiritualize this and saying Moses represents the law, Elijah represents the prophets, and the whole message of the law and the prophets is about the death of Christ. And I think that's a, a fair thing to say. Um, verse 31 and verse 32. So here's Peter. See, Jesus took them with him, Peter, James, and John. Now, this is a remarkable thing. I mean, what would it be like to see Jesus trans see Jesus, one thing, you know, then he's transformed and, and glorious and his raiment, his clothes are glowing and then there suddenly here's Moses and Elijah, this just tremendous spiritual vision. Verse 32 says, Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. <laughs> so, so they're sitting there bored and they fell asleep. Um, I don't know how else to interpret that. Uh, they that were with him were heavy with sleep. But they woke up when this started taking place and they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. So evidently what happened was, here's, what I, here's how I interpret this. Jesus went up on this mountain and began to pray and they all sat down and, oh, oh man, oh, I can't keep my eyes open. Jesus is praying and uh, this thing's about to happen, but they don't know that. So oh, man, just let me rest my eyes for a minute. And so they fall asleep while Jesus is praying. And then suddenly this vision, like right out there in the open. And when it begins happening, that wakes them up. And so when they wake up, this remarkable thing is happening. And so uh, they don't know what to th they're either dumbstruck, I suppose, awestruck, I guess is the word. Um, Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. That's Moses and Elijah. That's really remarkable. Verse 33, And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, See, he could have just sat there and said, Wow, but he's got to say something. So he said, Master, it is good for us to be here. So let us make three tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said. In other words, he's just blabbing, you know, and he's saying, wow, well now that Moses and Elijah are here, let's make a, let's make a tent for them, <laughs> you know. Let's make a tent for you and a tent for them. Now, you know, if you look it up, commentators are divided about what he meant. Nobody knows what he meant. It even says here he knew not what he was saying. Did he mean that they're going to be here from now on, so we need to make a house for them to live in or a tent for them to live in? Or did he mean uh, we're going to build a new kind of uh, worship center? Uh, it's, it's like the best of everything, like Jesus and Moses and the light. I mean, what did he mean by that? He doesn't even know. It says he did not know what he was saying. He's just, again, putting his foot in his mouth. Uh, Jesus, in this case, didn't even bother to answer him. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them. And they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. So that shut them up, I guess. And, you know, Peter, that whole thing of him saying, uh, let's build, the, you know, that was just a nutty idea that came into his head. 
it had nothing to do with anything. And here was the message of the whole encounter uh, coming from God. This is my beloved son, hear him. So this voice from heaven is getting them back on the right track again. And that really is the thing that they should, should have drawn from this. But it was a remarkable experience. Verse 36 says, when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone. And they kept it close. That is, they kept it to themselves. And they told no man in those days any of the things which they had seen. Now later, when Peter writes his letters, he refers back to this. And he says, you know what? I saw this with my own eyes. But you know what he adds then? This is a wiser, older Peter writing in his letters. He says, we saw this appearance. I saw it with my own eyes. Nevertheless, he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. In other words, what's written in the scriptures is more certain than even an appearance like this. Okay, so that's, that's another one. Uh, here's, a, here's another example. Uh, Torin, this is, um, uh, let's see, Matthew chapter 14, starting with verse 22. Matthew 14, 22. This one is called, Peter walks on the water but sinks. <laughs> and he does, and both those things. Matthew 14, starting with verse 22. Now this is a, fa a famous incident. And I think Peter is so much uh, like the typical Christian. He, he's very enthusiastic, uh, but he gets in over his head and, and fails. It's so common. It's so uh, what did I say? 14. Oh, sorry. I mean, he's so, he's, so, he's impetuous. I guess that's the word for it. Uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. You see, Jesus kind of has a habit of doing this. Um, getting away from everyone and, and praying. And uh, you know, that's a whole other topic about why, why he did that, what was motivating him to do that. Uh, but he did. That was part of his practice. And when the evening came, he was there alone. And he put the, remember he put his disciples in a boat. Verse 24, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, and the wind was contrary. So Jesus put the disciples in this little boat, and he said, now go across this water here, and I'll meet you on the other side. And um, he goes up into this mountain to pray, and they're out there on the water, and a storm comes up. That can happen. And it says that um, it was tossed with waves. That means uh, it was big waves, a lot of wind. It said the wind was contrary. It means it's blowing hard on them. And they're struggling, in other words, against this uh, storm. And in the fourth watch of the night, this is really late at night now, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Now, that's pretty astounding. That's pretty remarkable. Not what they were expecting at all. They're out in the middle of this terrible storm. It's dark. And it says in verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. Uh, I'm going to guess what they mean is they didn't recognize it was Jesus, and they just said, that's a ghost out there. I mean, you know, let's just be honest. If you're out in the middle of a, a lake and it's late at night and you see somebody walking, <laughs> you're going to think, what am I looking at, you know? And it says they thought it was a ghost or a spirit. And it says they were afraid, and they cried out for fear. They might, you know, what they might have thought was, we're seeing a ghost because we're about to die. <laughs> you know, that's maybe what they thought. Whatever it is, they, they, they were troubled and afraid and scared. Uh, I'm going to say pro what, it, what it means is they did not recognize it was Jesus. And it's understandable. A big storm going on. And they didn't expect, see, they didn't know about Jesus walking on the water. We know that because uh, we've read this before. They didn't know that. Uh, verse 27, but straightway Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And I think this is so beautiful, by the way, as a little side thought, what he says here. Uh, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. In the midst of their trouble, in the midst of their struggle, in the midst of what they're experiencing, which they thought was a life-threatening, at least a negative situation, Jesus comes along and his response is, right in the middle, see the storm is still going on. They're still getting hit in the head with, with rain and winds blowing them every which way. Jesus comes right in the middle of all that and says, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And uh, the, the thing that always comes to mind, and I want to say this again, I've said this before, 
Every time I read this, I think to myself, what would Jesus say to you or to me if he came walking in this building? You know, he could do that. Uh, Peter, James, and John saw that vision right out in the open, and he's done it before in the pages of the Bible. He's appeared right in the physical world. And if he wanted to, he could open that back door of the church and he could walk right in here and uh, we would be astounded. But what would he say to us? How would he address us? You know, he knows you. He knows me. He knows us all as individuals. And not only that, see, these disciples, we're in a storm. We've got other things going on in our life. We've got things happening that concern us that are things that cause us anxiety or fear or worry. And, you know, we've all got our difficulties and uh, things to be worried about. Uh, but I like to think if Jesus did that, if he came in that back door and came walking in here in his robe and his sandals, just as real as you or me, he would walk up to each one of us, one at a time, look you in the eye, call you by name, because he knows your name, and say this exact same thing. Uh, cheer up, or be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. Now, uh, I think that's what he'd say. That's what he said to them. Why wouldn't he say, he would say the same thing to us. And I always tell that story, and then I look back at that door to see if he's going to do it. So far, he had never done it. So I'm telling you on his behalf, that's what he says. That's what he would say, and that is what he was saying uh, in the midst of our circumstances and difficulties and things we have to be anxious about. He would say, be of good cheer, cheer up. I'm here. It's me. It's really me. I'm really there. Even if we don't see him, be not afraid. So that's what he said to them. Now, that's a beautiful thing, you know. It's a, it's a beautiful um, idea that he is conveying to them. But Peter, <laughs> of all the disciples, Peter had to answer. See, the rest of them are just sitting there. I imagine them all, oh, that's beautiful, the rain and the wind and everything. But Peter says, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come to thee on the water. <laughs> you know, he's not content just to hear this beautiful message. He says, if that's really you, then... Tell me to come. On, that's What a weird request is that? He says, bid me come unto thee on the water. Well, what's Jesus supposed to do? It's really him. So Peter said, if it's really you, tell me to come and walk on the water. So it really is Jesus. So in verse 29 it says, and he said, come. <laughs> now the ball is back in Peter's court. What's he going to do? Now, I'm sure he never thought this through. You know what he's got to do now? <laughs> Jesus did, come on. So Peter's got to get up on that boat, rocking on the water, and rain, rain and wind, and he's got to step off into that water. But he does. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now that's pretty remarkable. That is pretty astounding. But, here's the big but. This is, see, I think this is so much like human nature, like us. He started well, but he got distracted. He's not perfect. He's not like Jesus. He's not perfect. But he's got a heart, a sincere heart, and he wants to do the right thing. So he got down out of the ship. Verse 30 said, But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Now Jesus just got through telling him, Don't be afraid. Yet he says, uh, If it's really you, bid me come to the end of the water. So he goes out on the water. And he's, he forgets about Jesus momentarily. He starts looking at the wind and the waves, and he becomes afraid. And as he became afraid, it says he began to sink, which is in itself remarkable. I've never seen anybody yet that goes and jumps in the pool and begins to sink. Usually you, you, you just sink right away. But he was beginning to sink as he became afraid. And uh, see, he stepped out and, and tried to do something that was over his head. It was too, it's too much for him. He, he would have been better off just stay in a boat and appreciate that good message of Jesus. Uh, but he said, if it's really you, bid me come. So Jesus said, come. So he stepped out of the boat, but then he became afraid. This is a failure on Peter's part. And he began to sing. Nevertheless, he cried and said, Lord, save me. In other words, I, I got out here and started doing something that too hard for me, too big for me. And he's sinking. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. And look at what his answer is. He said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Uh, also, th this expresses the sympathy of Jesus. Peter failed. It was a failure on his part. Uh, probably you could say due to his own sort of, you know, over-enthusiastic 
um, you know, idea about, about things. There was no requirement for him to do that. Jesus didn't tell them to do that. He just took that upon himself to get out of the boat and walk. And then he got afraid and began to sink. And Jesus said, oh, thou of little faith. In other words, you know, you started out well, but you let doubts come in. Well, that's so human. You know, that's so much like us. Nevertheless, Peter's not excluded. This doesn't, you know, uh, this doesn't uh, disqualify Peter in any way. It just shows that he's uh, a human, just like us. Uh, I think this is so uh, very human, uh, very much like us. Okay, there's uh, one more I want to look at. This one is called, uh, Torn. this is in Matthew chapter 26, starting with verse 31. Matthew chapter 26, starting with verse 31. Uh, I call this when Peter makes promises that he can't keep. Uh, again, very human. Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. Now this one is a pretty serious one. Uh, these others are kind of lighthearted and I'm sort of making a joke about them, but this is actually a pretty serious failure on Peter's part. Nevertheless, Jesus never rejects him. He doesn't reject anybody. Um, but nevertheless, Peter failed pretty big time here. So this is at the end of Jesus' ministry. This is right after the Last Supper, what we call the Last Supper, Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. And uh, the Roman soldiers are coming to arrest Jesus. And they just finished their meeting together, what we call the Last Supper, when Jesus took the bread and the wine and blessed it and said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for the discharge from penalty from sins. And then they got up and left. In verse 31 it says, Jesus turned to them and he said, all of you will be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I'm risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. You see, he's telling them straight up what's going to happen. And he says, you will all be offended because of me. But Peter, verse 33, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Now, he's making a pretty big, bold promise. This is like, this is so like human nature. This big, bold promise. Jesus just got through saying, you're all going to be offended because of me. Uh, but Peter said, not me. Uh, that's never going to happen to me. Verse 34, Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee that this night... Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice, three times. That's pretty bold. He's telling him. But Peter still uh, is so determined to make, he's making promises that he can't keep. Verse 35, Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Likewise said all the disciples. He got through telling them, you're all going to be offended because of me. Peter said, not me. Even if I have to die with you. See, this is a pretty bold promise. Um, making promises he can't keep. Uh, I'm going to go on reading just a little bit. I want you to see something. Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and heavy. And then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Wait here and watch with me. And he went a little further, verse 39, fell on his face and prayed, O Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Uh, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. Now, this is, this is so like them. Peter just got through saying, I'm so dedicated to you, I'll die with you. But I'm sleepy right now. So, <laughs> so he fell asleep. This is just like what happened on that other occasion up on that mountain of transfiguration. And Jesus said, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Verse 41, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, Jesus understands human nature, and he nails it here. You know, you've got the right attitude, but in, in the reality, in the flesh, uh, it, you know, you're not as strong as you think you are. And he went again the second time and prayed in verse 42, saying, oh, my father, if this cup not pass for me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. And he came to his disciples and said to them, Sleep on now, 
take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, for the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Verse 47, And while he yet spake, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves, and the chief priests and elders of the people. All the soldiers, the popo, as we might say, the, the police are there. Um, verse 48, Now he that betrayed him, that's Judas, gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, and the same as he, hold him fast. That's because it was dark and they didn't want there to be any confusion. And Judas said, I'm going to go and give the guy a kiss. That's Jesus. Uh, forthwith he came to Jesus, said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? And then came they and laid their hands on Jesus and took him. Now verse 51. You got that one, Torah? Verse 51. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Now, this just says in Matthew, one of them that were with him. If you read all the Gospels, this is one of those rare occasions in which a story is uh, written down in all four Gospels. Now, Matthew politely does not tell us who it is. John, on the other hand, if you read between the lines, you might get the idea that there is a little bit of friction between John and Peter. And when you read John's Gospel, when he relates this, he tells us who it is that drew out a sword and, st and struck off the servant's ear. It was Peter. John tells us Peter is the one that drew out a sword. He's going to fight, you know. He got through saying, you know, I'm going to, if I have to die with you. So he's going to fight and defend Jesus. What does Jesus say to him? Verse 52. Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that... I cannot pray unto the Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, uh, that this must be so? And so we know, uh, we know what's happening. Let's go on reading. Uh, verse 55 says, In that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, Are you come out against me as a thief with swords and staves to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hands on me, uh, no hold on me. Verse 56 but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets should be fulfilled, saying, "Then all the dis uh, be fulfilled." Then all the disciples forsook him and fled, just like he said. He promised that they would all be offended, and when this happened, uh, they all got scared and ran away. Now, uh, they took him to uh, it says to Caiaphas, the high priest, and uh, verse 58. Skip on down to verse 58, Torm. Peter followed after afar uh, unto the high priest's palace. And he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now, I, I, I kind of read between the lines here, and I think Peter, he's upset, he's worried, but he, he doesn't really quite understand, but he wants to see what's going to happen. So he's sitting there on the kind of the outskirts, you know, uh, right outside, you might say outside the door, and he's watching kind of watching through the door to see what's going to happen. Skip down to verse 69. Remember Peter's promises, though I'll forsake you, I'll never forsake you. Even if I have to die with you, I'll never deny you. Verse 69, it says, Now Peter sat without, that's outside, uh, in the palace. And a damsel, uh, that's a woman, uh, a girl, came to him and saying, Thou, thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. Verse 70 said, He denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. You know, Jesus predicted and said, You're going to deny me. And he even told why. He said, Your spirit is, The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He got scared. That's the only way to understand this. And when this little girl came up and said, Oh, yeah, you were with him. He said, No, 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 not me. He denied before them all. But he's not done yet. Verse 71. And when he was gone out uh, into the porch, another maid, another girl, uh, and said to them that were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 72. And he denied again with an oath. He swore uh, with an oath. I do not know the man. Verse 73. It's not over yet. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, 
Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. In other words, you talk just like all those guys. Verse 74. He's really upset now. Then he began to curse and swear. You know, the disciples of Jesus cursed and swear? Yep. Peter, I'm sure as a sailor, he knew a lot of curse words. <laughs> he knew a lot of bad language. And he was deploying it all right now. He began to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. Verse 75, Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Well, uh, Jesus told him, you know, your spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak. Now, can I tell you something? Uh, this is pretty serious, what J Peter did here. I think anyone would understand to deny, to publicly repudiate Christ, to publicly deny him with an oath, with cursing and with swearing, to reject him in front of an audience. I think uh, anyone would say, uh, this is pretty serious. And most people think, uh, most Christians think, if I were ever to do that, then, I, then I'd be rejected forever. I'd be kicked out. I've talked to people before who think that wrongly about themselves because they've made a mistake, because they've said something wrong, because they've, uh, you know, uh, done other things about which they condemn themselves that they're now on the outs, that they're rejected. Did you know that Peter did this? Remember, this is the guy that Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church. Jesus knows, not just Peter, but all Christians, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Christians, and not just Peter, but everyone, from top to bottom, uh, all inclusive, are prone to making dumb mistakes. Now, you know, probably you and me haven't really done anything as bad as that. But maybe what if someone did? Did Jesus reject Peter? No. Did Jesus reject you if you make a mistake? No. Does he reject any other Christian if they do wrong or make a mistake? Or even if they, in their minds, what they call backslide? No. He doesn't reject anyone. He didn't reject Peter. He knew ahead of time how weak uh, the bodies we live in the flesh we live in, uh, the nature of humanity. He knows how weak it is. And nevertheless, he says, this is what I'm going to build my church on. And he says it's a rock. Because underneath all of that is a simple, basic, childlike faith in Christ. And though on the surface, on the outside, we may make all kinds of mistakes and all kinds of failure, underneath it all is just a simple faith in Christ. Uh, and Jesus said, that's the rock. Peter is an example of the rock on which I'll build my church. Now let's just finish the story of Peter with an example. This is the last thing I'm going to read. This is a, a postscript. This is in John chapter 21 starting with verse 15. And this is the last thing I'm going to read. John chapter 21 with verse 15. I think uh, we need to tie up the story of Peter with this. Now this is after the resurrection of Jesus. After the death of Jesus, three days later he was raised from the dead. And the disciples are still kind of like wondering, what are we supposed to do? And Peter is even thinking, what am I supposed to do? He says to all of the other disciples, I think I'm going to go fishing. And they said, all right, we're going to go with you. And so they go out just like they're doing at the beginning of the Gospels. They're out fishing, and they spent all night. They didn't catch anything. And then Jesus appears on the shore, and they don't recognize him. And he shouts out to them and says, hey, guys, throw your net on the other side of the boat, and you're going to get a catch. And so Peter remembered that's how his, his experience with Jesus started out. And so he threw the net on the other side of the boat, and they caught so many fishes they couldn't pull them all in, just like in the beginning. And so Peter recognized who it was. That clued him in, and he knew it was Jesus. And so he threw off his outer robe, and you might say just in his basic you know, uh, undergarments, he dove into the water and swam to the shore. And when they all got there, they pulled all the fish up here and said, Jesus said, come and dine. Let's, let's all eat together. And they're all looking at him like, man, can this really be true? That's kind of my spin on. So in verse 15, we're talking about Peter. This one that Jesus said, this is the rock on which I'll build my church. Even though, as we've seen, prone to making mistakes, prone to making promises he can't keep, prone to uh, putting his foot in his mouth, uh, prone to failing in all kinds of different ways. And 
remember the last thing that happened, his last uh, contact with Jesus, he denied him three times. Verse 15 says, so when, this is chapter 21. Uh, when they dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas. Do you remember that's what he said to him when he said, when he named him Peter. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Now we don't know for sure if he meant these fish that you just caught or these other disciples. And maybe Peter didn't know what he meant either. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, or yes, Lord, you know that I love thee. And he said, Feed my lambs. Verse 16, he said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said, Feed my sheep. Verse 17, and he saith unto him the third time. You remember he denied him three times. So he let him, he gave him three chances to say this and, you know, confirm um, his actual love for him. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Why does he keep saying that, by the way? Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Uh, you remember when he called him Simon, uh, son of Jonas, and he called him, named him Peter, he said, I am going to build my church on you. And he's saying it, this is how, this is how, you're, going to, how you're going to do it. You've been through all these experiences, now all these others that are going to be my church that are just like you, feed them. He doesn't mean fish or food. He means from your experience and your relationship with me, you've got some experience and knowledge now. You know what I'm like. Uh, explain it. And tell them about it. Uh, let them in on it. Now he adds something else after he three times tells him, feed my sheep. <laughs> Uh, you remember what Peter uh, promised. He said, though all forsake thee, I'll never forsake thee. And even if I die with you, I will never forsake you. Well, Jesus remembered that, I guess, and took him up on it. Verse 18, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, or bind thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Verse 19, what does this mean? Well, this spake he, verse 19, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. Now, um, I think Peter was able to read between the lines and he's predicting when you're old, when you're older, they're gonna bind you and they're gonna stretch out your hands like just like me on the cross, evidently is what he means. Uh, and it, tradition tells us, not in the Bible, but church tradition says that Peter was uh, actually crucified, just like Jesus. And on his own insistence, they turned him upside down because he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus. But anyway, after giving him this, this kind, of, um, kind of fearful, stark prophecy, he said, follow me. Now, and Peter, you know, he still kind of sticking his foot in his mouth. He's got to always answer back, you know, verse 20. Then Peter turning about, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved following. Now, this is John's gospel. And you'll notice when you read John's gospel, John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. So that's John he's talking about here. Peter turned around and he saw John, who calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved which also leaned on his breast at supper, John reminds you that, and said, Lord, who is he that betrayed thee? That's what John said. So Peter turned around and saw John there, and he's just got this prophecy from Jesus about how he's going to die. Verse 21, Peter, seeing him, saith unto Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? <laughs> In other words, what's going to happen to him? Give him one of those. You know. Verse 22, Jesus said to him, If I will that he tarry until I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. In other words, this is like saying, mind your own business. Or as we say, mind your own beeswax. Uh, this is no concern of yours, what is going to happen with him. John goes on and adds here. He didn't say, I'm going to live forever. He said, if 
I choose for him to go on living till I come back. Uh, what's that to you? But the point is, uh, f follow me, you know? Yeah, you follow me, he's going to follow me, and you don't need to worry about what he's doing. And that is also good advice for all of us. We're so easily distracted by what everybody else is doing. Okay, I think that's all we got today. Uh, so Peter is the prototypical Christian. He is just like us in every way. And uh, nevertheless, Peter was uh, solid and uh, like a rock. And that's what Jesus sees in all of us. Even though we're prone to failure and mistakes and we feel weak, Jesus says uh, that we're just like that.